Hi, I'm Kali Fajardo Anstein, and it is my great pleasure and honor to read to you tonight from The Soul of Woman by Isabel Allende. We have talked about sexual passion and romantic passion, but what does it simply mean to be passionate? According to the dictionary, it's a disorderly mood disturbance. It is also described as a powerful and irresistible emotion that can lead to obsessive or dangerous actions. My own definition is less somber. Passion is unbridled enthusiasm, exuberant energy, and determined devotion to someone or something. The good thing about passion is that it pushes us forward and keeps us committed and young. I have been training for years to be a passionate old woman, just as others train to climb mountains or play chess. I don't want to allow caution, so often prevalent in later years, to destroy my passion for life. Almost all the female protagonists of my books are passionate because they are the people who interest me. I want characters capable of committing obsessive and dangerous actions, as the dictionary says. A safe and quiet life is not good material for fiction. I have sometimes been described as a passionate person because I never sat quietly in my house, as I was supposed to. I have to clarify that my risky endeavors were motivated not always by a passionate temperament, but because circumstances threw me in unexpected directions. I did the best I could. I have lived in a rough sea where waves would lift me and then drop me to the bottom. This surge has been so strong that before, when things went well, I would prepare myself for a violent fall, which I considered inevitable instead of relaxing in the tranquility of the moment. Now, it's not like that. Now, I drift along, day by day, happy just to float as long as possible. Though I have always had passion when I was a young woman, I don't think I had literary ambition. I think the idea never crossed my mind because ambition was a male thing. When applied to women, it was an insult. The women's liberation movement allowed some women to appropriate this concept, just as they did with assertiveness, competitiveness, desire for power, eroticism, and the self-confidence to say no. Once in a while, the women of my generation grabbed the opportunities that were available. Not that there were many, but we rarely had a plan for success. In the absence of ambition, I had good luck. Nobody, let alone I, could foresee the immediate acceptance that I enjoyed with my first novel and have experienced with the rest of my books. Maybe my grandmother was right when she prophesied that her granddaughter was going to be fortunate because I had a birthmark in the shape of a star on my back. For years, I thought that birthmark was unique, but as it happens, it's very common, and moreover, it fades over time. I was always disciplined in my work because I internalized my grandfather's words that leisure time was dead time. I followed that rule for decades, but I have learned that leisure can be fertile soil where creativity grows. I am no longer tormented by an excess of discipline as I was before. Now I write for the pleasure of telling a story word by word, step by step, enjoying the process without thinking of the result. I don't tie myself to a chair eight or ten hours a day, writing with the concentration of a notary. I can relax because I have the rare privilege of having loyal readers and good publishers who don't try to influence my work. I write about what I care for in my own rhythm. In those leisure hours that my grandfather considered wasted, the ghosts of imagination become well-defined characters. They are unique. They have their own voices, and they are willing to tell me their stories if I give them enough time. I feel them around me with such certitude that I wonder why nobody else perceives them. The ability to overcome obsessive discipline didn't happen in one day. It took me years. In therapy and in my minimal spiritual practice, I learned to tell my superego to back off and leave me alone. I want to enjoy my freedom. 
Superego is not the same as consciousness. And the former punishes us and the latter guides us. I stopped listening to the overseer inside me who demands compliance and performance with the voice of my grandfather. The race uphill is over. Now I stroll calmly in the land of intuition, which has turned out to be the best environment for writing. Thank you very much. And now it is my great honor to turn tonight's conversation over to the great Isabel Allende. Hello. Can I, can, I, can I speak first? I want to thank Callie. Of course. She is so wonderful. Thank you, Callie. You've been so great. Thank you. Yeah, that was a lovely reading. And I think yeah. such an amazing, um, amazing portion of the book that I think really gets at the heart of a lot of what I want to talk to you about. So that was that was perfect. Um, I thought we could start with sort of a simple question, which is why did you decide to write this book and why now? It wasn't my idea. Yeah. <laughs> a few years ago, I gave a conference in a, a speech in a conference in Mexico, and it went viral. Mm. So my publishers in Spain thought of publishing a little booklet with a speech. And I said, wait a minute, let me read it. So I took a look at it, and it was so stale, dated. In a few months, a lot had happened. The Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter, women protesting in the streets, the thesis in Chile. I mean everything. So I said, no way. But then I started thinking of my own journey as a woman and as a feminist. And uh, that gave birth to this book that is totally different from the speech, really. Yeah, yeah. And why okay. now? Because, uh, because so much is happening. There's a new wave of young feminists that are so inclusive. They have invited to the movement everybody else i mean gender doesn't define feminism anymore lgbt transgender non-binary males everybody's in there yeah yeah and what was that like for you to sort of go over your life and look at it through the lens of feminism interesting interesting because uh, i realized that that is the thread that has linked every year of my life yeah. I have had many incarnations. I have been many people in my life. And that's the way it happens when you live long. Yeah, life changes you and circumstances change. I have been everything. I have been all my life. I've been a foreigner. So I've moved from one place to another. And in every one of those moves, I needed to reinvent myself. But the thread that has linked everything is my obsession with justice. And that has manifested itself in feminism. Feminism is a revolution, and all revolutions begin with rage, being furious at, at some kind of injustice or exploitation or violence. Yeah. And what fuels any change and revolution is rage. And I have had it all my life. But rage needs to be channeled. You cannot just let it loose and destroy your life. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, like you said, you, uh, you've been able to live a really long time, which is such a blessing. Um, and I, I wonder how your feminism has evolved over the years and, um, and what it's, whether its meaning has changed for you, whether its place in your life has changed and just what that's looked like um, as you've grown older. It has changed, but not that much. Mm. Um, before the... Before feminism, I had the rage, since I was very, very young, five years old. Mm -hmm. I, I could perceive how unfair the world was, and I didn't like it. Yeah. But when I finally discovered that I'm not a lunatic, that there was a movement out there called the Women's Live, and women were writing also, I, I could read those books, mm -hmm. that allowed me to, to feel part of something much bigger. And then I started working as a journalist in a feminine feminist magazine where I could write and I could research and I could really be in touch with my readers. That magazine only lasted six years in Chile and it changed the culture. It was so incredibly important. Yeah. Uh, and I was part of it. So at the beginning, like all revolutions, you, you just 
go ahead. And you don't have a roadmap. So, so you do the best you can and you reach crossroads and, and sometimes you hit a wall and sometimes there is a backlash and, and things stall. So there has been all that and there has been waves of, of feminism and moments when women didn't want to be called feminists because uh, men have been very successful in depicting women as these crazy man haters that didn't shave their armpits and smell terribly. <laughs> well, that they were very successful and, and many people believed that, which yeah. is absolutely not true. That yeah. being a feminist is not the opposite of being feminine. Quite, I, I would say that they are very much connected yeah and uh, and so in time in life i have seen these waves i have seen how it has changed by my obsession with it and my uh, clear purpose mm -hmm. has always been there and for me it was never a war against men it yeah. was an uprising against the patriarchy and the patriarchy is a system of oppression that gives the male gender supremacy over women other species, nature, and other men as well. Because those men who don't fit in the system are also victims yeah. of the system. So yeah. that's what I want to, to defeat the patriarchy and replace it with the help of men, of course. Yeah. Something that was really interesting to me in your book is that I think you, you're right, obviously, that men have done a great job at painting feminists as like man hating or, mm -hmm. you know, really extreme in a lot of ways and so I found it really lovely that your book focused on a lot of things that are as you said very feminine um, your uh, as you said at your vanity or like that how much you like to be made up and how much you care about beauty um, and uh, romantic love is something that you also wrote about a lot a lot and I wonder how your feminism has coexisted with those things and if they ever felt like they were in conflict or if you always kind of felt like everything was integrated I always felt they were integrated, like motherhood. Uh, uh, being a mother and loving being a mother, loving having my newborn babies at my breast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was a feminist thing too. Yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't at all contradictory. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the fact that I love clothes and I love to have a beautiful home with flowers and I love to cook doesn't mean that I'm not in the struggle. I am. And I am an activist, but I can also be very happy in my role as a woman. I would hate to be a man. I love being a woman. Everything about being a woman is great. <laughs> yeah, it's true. You, um, in the book, you reference a conversation that you had with your daughter, Paula, when she was around 20 years old. And she sort of told you to stop saying feminism or stop talking about feminism because it was sort of stodgy and old and, and unsexy, I think is how you described it in the book. And it's so funny because um, I was reading that and a couple of weeks ago, I was having a conversation with someone in my life who's a young, a young girl, um, a teenager who was expressing similar kind of ideas about feminism and and really felt that um was sort of buying into a lot of the messaging that men put out there about like feminists being man haters etc and i wonder what um how you talk to young people about feminism or how you suggest that people talk to young people about feminism in a way that keeps it relevant for them and that helps them see its relevance well, young women who have not hit the workforce yet mm -hmm. and live in, in, a, in privileged situations, in, in parts of the world where they have some rights, they have access to healthcare, to education, they are interconnected with the technology that we have today, they might feel that, that uh, what's the point? But then as soon as they get out there and start working and living in the real world, then they realize that they are in great disadvantage to men. And then is when they start thinking about this. Now, what my message to my daughter was, first of all, that will happen to you. And you are benefiting right now of the struggle of your mothers and grand, of your mother and grandmother. But also, because you have this situation, which is privileged in many ways, you are responsible for your sisters in the rest of the world who have not even heard about it. 
Girls are being sold into premature marriage in many places. Eight, nine-year-old girls sold to men who could be their fathers, grandfathers, really, who are forced to have sex and give birth at a time when their bodies are not prepared for it. Girls sold into prostitution, into forced labor, genitally mutilated. Women and girls are the first victims in any conflict and in any catastrophic situation. Let's talk about what is immediate now, the pandemic. Women were the first to lose their jobs, will be the last one to get back their jobs. They're at home, in poverty, in charge of the children who can't go to school and often with an abuser in the house. Domestic violence has increased everywhere in the world during the year of the pandemic. Crime against, crimes against women. So women are victims of violence everywhere. A young girl who is protected by her family, her community, her school, doesn't feel it yet. But there will be a point when she will realize that she cannot walk alone in the streets at night. She has to be careful when she crosses in front of a construction and it's full of workers there, male workers. She will not get, get in a car that she doesn't know the driver. She will not get in a, go in a bar if she is not sure that she can get out. So we live threatened with a feeling of, un, of being unsafe. In other places, with fear, real fear, because there is a war against women, an undeclared war. Violence against women, which for some reason is called domestic violence, as if it was less of a violence, and it is just as awful. Crimes against women, femicide, all that exists in the world today. So tell your friend, your little friend, that if she doesn't like the word feminism, it doesn't matter, don't use it, but do the work. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, write, you wrote a lot about the experience of growing older. And um, you described, you said something along the lines of like, this is the era of the emboldened grandmother. And I thought that was such an amazing line. And I thought, um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about what you meant by that. Well, now people are living much longer than their parents. Mm -hmm. And women are living much longer than men mm -hmm. because they take better care of themselves. They're more resilient biologically, but also they take better care of themselves. So usually women live longer. They become widows or so they are alone and they are an, a number that is increasing every year of emboldened grandmothers who have good health. Many of them have resources, enough resources so that they can work for the community or serve others or do some activism of some kind. Yeah. According to the Dalai Lama, it's the older women in the West who can change the world. Why in the West? Because we have more information, education and health care and resources. The other thing that is interesting is that now we have more women who have access to money and they become philanthropists and they, they spend their money in programs for other women, which is great because philanthropy, like governments, would spend $1 for programs for girls and $20 for programs for boys. So now that's changing, the balance is changing also. So there, there is a lot of, that, that we can be optimistic about. And as an old grandmother, I could be a great grandmother by now if my grandchildren were a little bit more active, passionate, I would say, but they don't want children. So, but I'm a grandmother of adults and I am in the world. I am doing stuff. I, I'm active, I'm curious, I'm furious. I want to change the world. And I'm not the only one. I have so many friends my age that are into the same thing. Yeah, yeah. And often it's like a, women, as we grow older, as, as women grow older, it's like they're cast off, you know? They're sort of like, oh, yeah. like, you're not a part of society anymore. You're yeah, you become invisible yeah. and a problem. And uh, it, it's, <laughs> but it doesn't happen the same with men. You have this ugly, old men, smelly, drunk, terrible health, bad teeth, 
who feel entitled to a woman 30 years younger. Mm -hmm. How do you really, what are they thinking? Right, right. Well, it's what they have, the messaging they find for their whole lives is that they can get anything that they're, they're entitled to anything that they want. Um, and you, you also wrote a lot about um, sensuality and sexuality um, throughout the years. And I wonder why it was important for you to include that, to address that aspect of your experience. Because it's part of feminism. It has to do with feminism. Um, our sexuality has been denied to us by the patriarchy. Mm -hmm. When, when in, in, I mean, in every era, just look at women's shoes, at women's clothes. A long time. I mean, you can you can go back to Victorian times or back to whatever time you want, mm -hmm. and you will see women restrained by society and restrained by everything. Not only Moors and religion, but the clothes they wear. The way they have, they do their hair, everything tends to make them less capable, less strong. Mm -hmm. So they can they are more defenseless, more vulnerable, and so that also includes controlling women's sexuality and fertility. Yeah. The extreme case is genital mutilation, because the idea is that women should not feel ple the pleasure of orgasm. Uh, but there are many other things that also keep women out, separated from her right to be sexual. I'm not talking about only sensual, sexual. Mm -hmm. Sexuality has traditionally been a male field, not for females. But we have claimed it as feminists and we have to defend it, defend it and, and not, not allow, for example, we live now in the world of pornography. And most pornography is violence against women. So we have to be also active there to, to transform the industry into something that is not so dangerous and offensive for women. Because you can't have young boys who get initiated into the idea of sex watching that kind of horrible pornography mm -hmm. in which women are are not are treated like animals yeah yeah it's so interesting because one of the questions that i had in my mind that i wanted to ask you was whether feminism was as vital today or is as vital today as it has been it as it was a century ago or 60 years ago or whatever the case but the more you talk the more it seems like a silly question <laughs> because um of course it is you know and um and this just the kind of laundry list of things that you know, we still have so much work to do on um, make it really apparent. But I wonder, you know, as, as, as the, the evolution of feminism that you've been able to see, um, first of all, how does Me Too and everything that's been happening over the last few years fit into that? And um, how do you feel generally about the changes that you've seen um, during your lifetime? I am very happy to see the changes now to see this new wave of young people. And I say people are not only women because some young men who have been raised by feminist mothers are into the movement as well. And, and well, all kinds of, of gender mm -hmm. can, can part part does participate. Mm -hmm. But not only that, what does, how does patriarchy work? Patriarchy, like, is, as I said, a system of oppression. Mm -hmm. How do you oppress people? By dividing them, by putting them in categories. So you have ethnic, racial, gender, age categories that separate people. Because if all those people who are the immense majority got together, the patriarchy would be defeated very fast. Mm -hmm. So the whole point is keeping them apart. I had a wonderful conversation with Alicia, Alicia Garza, mm -hmm. the one of the founders of the co-founder of Black Lives Matter. And she wrote a book of the purpose of power. And we started talking about in how how often and in many, many in many ways movement, the movement against racism intersects with the the movement against misogyny. So in a way, we are all fighting for the same causes in different fields, 
let's get together. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's that's such a good point. Um, and often people get so caught up in the infighting and you know think feeling the, like they're caught in the in the And some, sometimes what I, I keep telling my my grandchildren that for example, I'm totally I agree totally with the fact that they are non-binary and that they need or they want to mark it by having their own pronouns. And I try to be respectful to that. But I keep saying, don't go into the minutia. What is important is that we get together and that we find ways of working together because we have so much in common that the patriarchy tries to keep apart. Yeah. Yeah, you wrote in the book that um, they realize how powerful our voices are, and that's why they try to keep, you know, keep us separated and silent. Yeah. Um, you also write a lot about passion, which I love. First of all, I think the whole book has so much passion in it, and um, it's just so clear that's where it's coming from. Um, but I love that you uh, and and it's it's Kali read a portion of that um, just now, where where she wrote the, read the de your definition of passion and how you've been training. You said you were you've been training for it to be a to be a passionate um, old woman, and I wonder what that training looked like, and um, and and how you've developed that passion in your life, and how you encourage others to do the same. I think that my passion could be genetic. <laughs> but it also started with rage, with a rage against what I felt was an unfair world yeah. and all the things that shocked me. That kept me, that was the fuel, that rage was the fuel that kept me always mobilized. Yeah. And that's a form of passion to have a purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, when I say that I have been training, it's because people think that when you get old, you get wiser. No, most old people are demented, so they are not wiser you only become more <clears throat> of what you have always been. If you have been a nasty person, no one will like you when you are old. You will not become all of a sudden nice and generous. That doesn't happen. So when I say we have to train for everything, we have to train to have a good body and a good health and, and whatever. Intellectually, we need to train too. But when I say train for passion is keep yourself engaged in the world. Try to make things better. Serve others. Connect. Mm. Connect to others. And, and that keeps you going with incredible strength. That's why I have been so sad with the pandemic because so many people are isolated and lonely. And then when you, when you are lonely, you get depressed. The worst punishment that you can have in jail is to be in, you know, alone in a cell. In, con in solitary confinement, because yeah. that kills your soul. Get out there, participate, be with others, help. Yeah. How have you, how has the pandemic been for you? Have you um, reckoned with that sense of loneliness? Or um, I know that you, you're, you have a partner, obviously, but um, do you, um, well, yeah, did you experience any of that, ch of those challenges during the pandemic? No because my work requires time, solitude, and silence, which was hard to get before the pandemic, because I was always pulled in different directions and too busy and there was too much going on. But then everything stopped suddenly. And for, for one year, I have been alone in this place here. This is the attic of my little house. It's very small, it's like a den. And I spend my life here. So in, last year, I was able to write that book, that the, the Soul of a Woman, and a novel that I finished in December and will probably be published next year in February. Wow. So, um, and now this year I started something else, another novel. All this work I can do happily because I am locked inside my house. Wow. But I do understand how other people feel. I have friends my age and young people who are very depressed and sad and lonely in spite of Zoom, in spite of the phone and, and all the ways that we can communicate now. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's obviously also a time of like such communal grief and, um, and, and loss. And I wonder um, as someone who has had a great amount of loss in your life and 
obviously you've written about the um, the loss of your daughter. I wonder um, what like whether this moment has brought anything up like that, and also what advice you have for other people who are now experiencing um, losing a loved one, whether it's a daughter, a parent, a partner, um, whatever it is, or whomever it is. It is terrible to lose someone you love, and more terrible even when you cannot be with them. So many people have lost partners or, or parents, and they have not been able to hold them in their arms. My, my parents died recently, very old, and they both died in my arms. And it, it, it was such a pain for me to see them leave, but also it was wonderful to be there with them. So uh, I think that when the pandemic is over, it will be a time for collective grief and collective mourning. And they, we will have to come up with ceremonies, with ways in which we can honor those who have left us. Yeah. And ways in which in, individually and collectively, we can uh, transform the, this mourning into art, into, into ways of interconnection. Um, we, we need to grieve. We do need to do that. Yeah. Yeah, you said in the book that you hoped that this would be almost like a pivot point, that people would use yes. it as a time of, of change. Can you talk a little bit more about that, about what you hope to see um, it, when, we, when we come out of this moving forward? Well, I hope that this long experience that has been for the first time a global experience. There has been other pandemics in the world before, but because people didn't travel so much, they would start, for example, in one place in, in, in 1918, the influenza pandemic started in Europe and in the United States, and it didn't arrive in Chile until two years later. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a global thing. <clears throat> Plus, people didn't have the connections we have today. So when I didn't, if I was living in 1918, I wouldn't know what was happening uh, in another country, let alone in another continent. Mm -hmm. This is the first time we have this global experience mm -hmm. that something happens to a person in China and it happens to all of us. And that the only way that we can defeat the virus is if we all act together. Mm -hmm. Because if one country improves the, the, the whole thing and, and it doesn't happen in the rest of the world, it's useless because the virus will still travel to that place no matter what. Yeah. So this, thing, this means that for the first time we know that we are one human family in one fragile planet. Yeah. So I hope that the new normalcy will be, maybe not immediately, but in, in the short term, mm -hmm. this experience will reflect a new normalcy. And it will be, uh, it, I hope, a time in which the world will be more sustainable, more inclusive, uh, less violent, and um, with, with a, a greater sense of being just one human family. My brother, who is a pessimist, thinks that what will happen is that we will become more tribal, we will start cannibal cannibalizing each other, we will, yeah, he, he thinks that everything will be way worse. But I write historical novels, so I study history. And the curve of evolution of humanity goes up. We are not going back to the Middle Ages. And that curve is not smooth. It goes like this. But every time there has been a major catastrophe, humanity learns the lesson and improves something. After this, I was born in the middle of the Second World War, mm -hmm. uh, times of the Holocaust, of the atomic bombs, when 50 million displaced people ju were just in Europe. Uh, and there was no United Nations. There was no declaration of human rights. There were the, the, yeah, all those things happened after the war mm -hmm. because of the tragedy that the world had experienced. Mm -hmm. So I do hope that we have learned something and we will be able to dream a better world and make it real. Yeah. 
especially because as you mentioned, so much has gotten worse for women during the pandemic. And so it's like, it's even more, um, more dire or more urgent for us. To yeah, so we have to fight with a knife between our teeth when the pandemic is over. Get out there and get your rights back and much more. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Um, I want to go back to the, the book really quickly. Um, There's a really funny section where you talked about why you don't write romance novels. And you kind of, actually, I kind of want you to tell us a little bit more about it because I thought it was so hilarious. Um, and and then maybe I can ask a follow up after. Did uh, you know? I like I love romance when I see, it, yeah. especially on TV. You know, what was the name of Bridge? What was the name of that TV series recently? Bridgerton. Rich oh, this is so embarrassing. I know I haven't seen it, but you haven't seen it. I saw the whole thing. Fascinated. My husband, of course, wouldn't watch it because he said it was completely stupid. But I love the dresses, the story, the love, the how cheesy it was. I loved it. So I wish I could write romance novels and if possible romance novels for TV. But I can't because you have to believe in the genre. You really have to believe that there are virgins with big breasts and, and, and green eyes who seduce the CEO who owns an island and a yacht and a jet, and he's the solution of love, but he falls for her, Wh whatever. I have never seen that in real life, so I can't write about it. I just love when I, when I see it, but can't write it. And every time I have tried to create a romantic um a romantic hero for my pro female protagonist i end up hating him and i say well if i hate him she will hate him too so i have to kill him and i he dies around page 112 except why two heroes one was sorrow of my book sorrow because i didn't invent the character he existed and he is the seducer direct but I mean, the, the perfect seducer mm -hmm. and the perfect romantic hero. So I couldn't kill him because he didn't belong to me. And then there was another hero that was Rodrigo de Quiroga in my book, uh, Ines of My Soul, but he really existed. And he really was the kind of man that I portrayed in the book. So I couldn't kill him either because he was a historical figure. <laughs> I thought that was so funny. And I thought it also said a lot about the sort of constraints that women are expected to um, to subscribe to if they're in love or if they're in a relationship, you know, it's kind of, um, and also how those come out often when you, like when you when you first meet someone, it seems lovely and it's amazing, but then always those kind of gender tropes tend to come out later on. Um, and I wonder what your experience has been in terms of like your romantic loves and reckon like. Um, negotiating that with your feminism? Like makeup, you know? I don't negotiate it. I just use makeup. Yeah. And the same with romance. I don't negotiate. I just fall in love. I become stupidly romantic. I make lots of mistakes. And then I get over it. <laughs> I fall on my knees and then I get back on my feet. And uh, they, look, I have been married three times. Uh, the first time with the father of my children, I was really young. I was 20 years old and I was madly in love with him and we had children and we were happy for 20 years. Mm -hmm. But we stayed nine more years together trying to fix a marriage that was dead. Then I fell in lust with an American lawyer and I came to his house. I was living in Venezuela without an invitation and forced him into marriage. We stayed together for... 28 years, the 20 years of, a, I think, a really good relationship. I was in love. And the last eight years trying to fix something that wasn't working. And now I am married for the third time and I'm 78. So I think, well, usually my marriages last in love for 20 years. So let's say that this marriage with Roger lasts 20 years. I'll be 98 by the time I fall out of love. Well, it will be time for another marriage, maybe, <laughs> with a man who's probably 106. That's amazing. <laughs> I love that. 
<laughs> it would be a romantic relationship, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, your life is, it seems, um, just based on what I've been reading, your life has been full of romance. Look, I, I don't want, I don't want you to think because it's not true that that I'm not in love with Roger. I am. No, uh, I am. <laughs> but I keep telling him, just don't sit in your laurels because and don't take me for granted. <laughs> I love that. That's amazing. Um, well, I think that we are going to start wrapping up in a few minutes for questions. But I did want to ask. You mentioned that you wrote this book during the pandemic. You wrote another book. Um, when is the other book being published? The other book is in, being translated right okay. now. It usually okay. takes a few months to translate and it will be published by Valentine on February 22nd next year. Okay, okay. Can in 11 months. About that it and it will be uh, an international launching in several languages simultaneously. Okay. And the name of the book is Violeta. And it is a story that begins in the pandemic, in one pandemic and ends in the other one, a hundred years in the life of a woman. Wow, that's amazing. Um, and then there was, you said you wrote a third one, right? No, I'm starting the third you one. started now. the third one, okay. Well, okay. three books in a year is a little bit too much. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna be so impressed. I've done no, no. the pandemic, so. Um, well, this has been so lovely. I think it's time Thank for questions. So much. Um, I wanted to say one last thing, which is that I've always wanted to talk to you personally and tell you that you start all your births, your your books on my birthday, which on January eighth. Congratulations! Yeah. <laughs> which is very <laughs> exciting for me. <laughs> um, anyway, Jared, go ahead. Um, yeah, this has been a lovely conversation. Um, so yes, yeah, so we have a few questions from the audience. Um, I'm gonna try to get through um, a number of them. Um, one of our first questions is, um, as a feminist writer, do you think that us, women from Latin America, have a long way to go in our fight for equality when we live, come from, sometimes have family members who comply with the idea that we are inherently less important? Of course, we have to come a, a long way, but that's the plight of most women all over the world. It's only in certain countries, in certain parts in the world where women that don't have that feeling of being left behind in many ways and submissive and silenced. Now, in the in the world of literature and in the book industry, women have come a long way. When I published The House of the Spirits in 1982, it was the time of the boom of Latin American literature. All male voices. There was not one female name. And since then, things have changed in Latin America and in the world. More women are published. The critics are still very hard on women. We were talking about romance. When a man writes something romantic and sentimental, it's supposed to be a person who has feelings, great feelings. When a woman does, she's sentimental and cheesy and put down. Mm. Yeah, um, this is a, a question that's um, kind of about like, your writing process. Um, what daily habits or rituals um, uh, do you have or might not might have um, to help calm your mind and prepare yourself before you're writing? Discipline. I uh, I have a day to start, January 8th. I've started all my books on January 8th. Why? Because my life is complicated. And if I don't set aside several months without traveling, without interviews, without social life, I wouldn't get anything done. Uh, so the, having a day to start helps me. Then I write every day. This is like training for sports. You really need the muscle. And nobody cares how many drafts you will discard. Nobody cares. The only thing that matters is the final product, the book. So what I, I keep repeating what I heard Elizabeth Gilbert say once. Somebody from the audience asked, what advice do you give to aspiring writers? And she said, don't expect your writing to give you fame or money. Write because you love the process. And that's what I think I do. I just love the process. I'm not thinking of the, of the end result, but the, the, the joy of the process, the joy of writing. So I can be disciplined also in the hours that I spend doing it and how many drafts I discard. And I don't care 
all the work that I invest is fine. I also research very carefully. That helps me with, to establish a sort of foundation for the story, the fictional story. Um, so you you, you mentioned um, you know that your current book is uh, it's it's being translated. Um, an audience member asked, "What's your attitude towards translation? And um, is there are you involved? Um, is there a way that you ensure that your translated work?" invokes the same type of feelings and reactions? My books are translated to 42 languages. And of course, I can't watch the translation of almost any of them. I, can, I could read the translation in French, in Italian or Portuguese, because somehow it sim it's similar to Spanish. But I only check the translation into English. And my translator, now I have a wonderful translator, a young woman. She sends me 30 or 40 pages and I, and I go very carefully and slowly through it. She does a wonderful job. I don't need to make almost, I mean, almost no corrections. She's just great. And that gives me confidence that the book will sound very good in English. But of course, language is like blood. It's, it's very personal and it's also cultural. Uh, what sometimes works in one language does not work in another language. And you have to allow that in a translation. For example, humor. Humor might be um, funny in, in Spanish in certain places and not funny at all or politically incorrect in, a, in English. Right, right. Um, people talk about writing strong female characters and you write them beautifully. Where do you garner your own strength from? What's the alternative? Well, first of all, I don't know any weak women, really. Most of the women I know are really power forces. Uh, I, um, my own strength comes from the fact that I have lived and I have had moments in my life, a lot of them, that have been difficult and, and tragic. And, and I have had to start again and leave everything behind several times. But there was no alternative, no other option. You had to do it. So you don't know how strong you are until you are tested. And I have been tested quite a bit. Mm. Um, so both of you um, in your conversation, you spoke a bit about um, how men perceive um, a feminist and what feminism means. An audience member asked, how do you suggest we help clarify to men that feminism is not attacked on men, especially those who believe um, women have more power actually in the patriarchal society we live in now. Women have acquired more power, but not enough. It's, we are not in equal terms. And how do you convince men? I think that frontal attack never works in this case. It's a, uh, you, you, I, when I was talking with Alicia Garza about race, and about how you have to confront the racist every time that the racist uh, a comment or something that is offensive. But you have to be careful how you do it because you will not convince anybody of anything that way. It's, it's asking questions. The best method is to ask questions. Why do you think that, that way? What do you think would happen if? Listen, listen. And that really helps. And um, I'm going to ask one more question and kind of just bring it back to the book. An audience member just wants to know, um, what was your favorite part in your writing process in writing this book? The, the favorite part for me was talking to other women about it. So when I started writing it, I started remembering my own life. But then I, 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 I research, as I said, I always research. So I started researching in books, researching quotes from women that, that are my heroes, etc. But then I, I just went out there and talked to, pe to people, to women. And I said, what do you think about this? How is your life? Ask the questions. And I got the wonderful answers. They, they, they I would say, wrote half the book for me. So talking to them was wonderful. Finding out about their lives, you know, Women love talking about their lives, telling their story, sharing their experiences. It, just give them the opportunity and they will open up 
It's not the same with men. Men are very uh, cautious about revealing much about themselves because they feel threatened by other men. They do that with women sometimes, but they, among themselves, very seldom. Women are exactly the opposite. They just open up and they tell you everything. And that was the best part for me of writing the book. Well, um, I want to thank you. And I also want to thank Conception de Leon for joining us um, to speak about The Soul of a Woman. Um, I also want to thank Kali Prado Anstein for a really lovely reading. And uh, this evening's ASL interpreters, uh, Susan Pacheco Correa and Selena Flowers of Pro Bono as ASL. Um, for everyone here, Pen Out Loud is Pen America's signature event series focusing on ampli amplifying diverse voices and convening vital conversations. Um, we're really um, just thrilled to have partnered with the Strand Bookstore and, to, and Scripps Presents for this entire season. Um, we also want to thank our regional partners, uh, the Austin Public Library Foundation, the Magic City Poetry Festival, Miami Book Fair, and Magic City Books. And this program was also made uh, possible in part from a grant from the City of Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs. Um, again, I just want to thank you, uh, Isabel Ande and Conception de Leon. Um, I, any last words here before we before we sign off? I would just say one more thing. Uh, when people ask me, what would you tell young women today? I would tell them that women alone are very vulnerable. But when we get together, we're invincible. So get out there and be together. That's beautiful. Um, Thank you, everyone. Um, you. Everyone, please continue to stay safe um, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Yeah, thank you. Thank Great you very much. Goodbye. Thanks a lot.